Sally works on a search and rescue team in the Rocky Mountains, and she will never forget the frantic search for a lost 11-year-old boy who was totally deaf and was losing his eyesight. He wandered off one day during a game of hide and seek. Nobody knew where he was, and his conditions made him particularly hard to find. He had been blowing a whistle given to him for just such an occasion, but because he couldn't hear, he didn't know how close he was to a, a mountain stream that was roaring and drowning out the sound of his whistle. So all that day, nobody could find him. After a harrowing night, sun arose and he started blowing his whistle again. And when he did, it wasn't very long until those searching for him had found him. He was very cold, but he was okay. Sally wants people like you and me to know that the key to survival often hinges on one thing, knowing and admitting that you're lost. She said kids will do it, but adults, they're a little bit different out in the mountains. Kids don't usually stray as far. They curl up in a, in a sheltered place and they wait for their rescuers. Adults, on the other hand, get lost in the Rockies and desperately try to save themselves. With kids, they're willing to admit they need help. When we turn to Psalm 121, we find a worshiper of God who's in the mountains. And he says, I lift my eyes up to the hills. From where does my help come? As one translation says, I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where will I get help? As you look at Psalm 121, it says something right above it, in all likelihood in your Bible, a song of ascents. Somewhere way back, that label was put on every psalm from Psalm 120 to Psalm 134. So there are 15 of them called songs of ascents. We don't know what that meant in the beginning, but as time passed, as Jewish Pilgrims made their way three times a year to Jerusalem to the festivals that God commanded. They began to sing these songs on the way. This was the playlist for their trip, their highway hymns, you might say. And this one says, I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? Now, by the time we finish this study this morning, I hope that the words of Psalm 121 will be in your playlist, in your heart and your mind, that they'll play there over and over and over again this week and be a regular part of your spiritual life if they're not already. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? Are you one of those people who's really inspired by the sight of mountains? And I know more people this time of year who are taking their trips to the beach. They want to be on the coast somewhere and in the sunshine, but a lot of us love the sight of mountains. And when we see them in all of their majesty and they seem so mighty, they make us think of the God who made them. We're awed by the creation, but more so by the Creator. And maybe these people who, who sang these songs on the way to Jerusalem all those years ago would have had those kinds of thoughts. Maybe as they made their trips, they would think about things that, that had been recorded in their history in Scripture that had happened at or on great mountains. God flooded the world, but he saved Noah and his family, and, and the ark came to, to rest on the mountains of Ararat. God told Abraham, sacrifice your son for me. And Abraham went to Mount Moriah as God commanded. And there God provided the substitute. But he saw Abraham's great faith displayed there at Mount Moriah. 
Maybe they would think of Mount Sinai, that place where the Israelites came to the foot of the mountain as they were in the wilderness. But God called Moses up to the top, and there he, he gave him the law as he thundered and, and lightning from that cloud. And Moses brought it back down to the people. Maybe much later they would have thought about the kinds of things that happened on Mount Carmel. You remember 1 Kings chapter 18 when Elijah was there for a showdown with the prophets of Baal and, and God showed decisively who's really God in Israel and everywhere else. All those things could have come to the mind of a, of a Jewish pilgrim on the way to Jerusalem as he lifted up his eyes to the hills. He's lifting up his eyes in anticipation and he knew that his destination was hidden among the hills. Across the page in my Bible, Psalm 125, verse 2, another of these songs says, As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people from his this time forth and forevermore. Maybe as you have encountered the words of this psalm before, that's the way you thought. You, you read these words with anticipation. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? And you think about the Lord with great anticipation, with what he will do for you soon and finally. But there might be some other legitimate ways that we could take this uh, statement in answer to this question. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? Those travelers on the way to Jerusalem might have seen those things that we read about here and there in the Old Testament high places. As we read about the history of Israel or, or Judah, somebody's a good king or somebody's a bad king, God will tell us. One of the things that made some of them good was that they tore down the high places. And one of the things that, that made some of the kings bad was that they left the high places, or even worse, they built the high places. Well, what were the high places? The high places were often built astride mountains. And there, the worship of God was mixed with the worship of false gods. Or the worship of God was ignored for the sake of false gods. And somebody's making this trip toward Jerusalem and, and they see one of the high places. And are you scared of what the sun is going to do beating down on you on this trip? Well, maybe you ought to go up to the high place and make an offering to the sun god. Are you afraid of what's going to happen to you at night on this trip? Well, maybe you ought to go up to one of these high places and make an offering to the moon god. And then you mix in the fact that, that often in the worship of these false gods, you could come away with your mind radically altered by some kind of concoction that they've given you up there. Or you can go up and, and enjoy illicit pleasures as so much of the worship of these false gods was just a cover for people acting out their sexual fantasies. They walk along and there's an allure to what's up at the top of these mountains. Should I stop there? One of my favorite shows to, to watch the last few years, I haven't seen it in a few now, was on our Ozarks Public Television when they played a, uh, a series produced out of Kansas City. It's called Rare Visions and Roadside Revelations. Am I the only one that's ever seen that show? Looks like it. <laughs> you, you are missing out. What these three guys did in this show was go to, to the places that are still there like used to be found all along Route 66. Or when you're driving around in the Ozark Hills on, on one of the scenic routes, but every once in a while somebody has built, opened up some kind of strange place, some kind of oddity that, that beckons you to stop off on your way to somewhere else. You got to see this. I kind of think about those as I think about the people traveling to Jerusalem, seeing the high places there. Should I stop or should I not? They're on their way to worship God, but, but here they're, they're drawn 
to something else. I lift up my eyes to the hills from whence comes my help. Is it from these false gods? One more way that uh, we could think about the mountains along the way. As, as this inspired writer says, I lift up my eyes to the hills from where does my help come. Is to think about how the mountains can intimidate us. Well, it's a big difference if you're driving through the mountains or you're walking through the mountains, isn't it? As these folks traveling to Jerusalem would think about the rigors of that journey, it didn't matter where you started in Palestine, it was uphill to Jerusalem where they were going. And then you never knew what would be around the next bend. You remember when Jesus told that wonderful parable of, of the Good Samaritan, how he illustrated it. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. So Jericho is way down lower than Jerusalem. And so you make this descent. If you're going from Jerusalem, you, you'd make an ascent. If you're going from Jericho to Jerusalem, but it wouldn't have surprised Jesus' original hearers to find that this man in Jesus' story was attacked by robbers beaten and left for dead. And as people are making their way to Jerusalem, back in, in, in these old times for those festivals that God commanded, they might lift up their eyes to the hills in anxiety. So any of these three ways might be the right way to read verse 1. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? If life seems like one mountain, one uphill climb after another, I need help. Where will I get it? Well, it won't come from the mountains themselves. It won't come from what dots the mountains. The writer says, my help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. My help comes from the Lord. Yahweh, Jehovah, your translation might read. That name by which God revealed himself to Moses and committed himself to his people. My help comes from the Lord who's committed to the salvation of his people. And the Lord is the maker of heaven and earth. So God has this commitment to his people and God certainly has the capability to give his people the help that he need, that they need. He created heavens and earth. So why not? Where will I get help? This writer says, my help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Let's read verses 3 and 4 together in this passage. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. My help comes from the Lord when life is uncertain. The writer says he will not let your foot be moved. God is there to help when life feels uncertain. Whenever you feel like you don't have a footing in life. God is there to help you as one of his people. In Jude verses 24 and 25, the, Jude offers praise to this God. It says, now to him who's able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. As the psalmist said it, he will not allow your foot to be moved. As Jude said it, he's able to keep your foot from stumbling. As we think about our, our way on life's journey, we should remember what the writer of Proverbs said in chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. One writer summed up the kind of things we think about that make life uncertain. He said, graduation, 
with no clear picture of what to do next, no job in sight, or at the other end of things, you get laid off. You have a son or a daughter who's heedless of the fire that they're playing with. You have a consuming depression. You go through a divorce that seems to end more than marriage. There's a terrible decision to be made. There's a, a move away from all that you've known and loved. There's retirement, but, but now what? There's that terrible diagnosis. Life can seem very, very uncertain. We can feel like we have no foothold at all. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved. The Lord will not slumber or sleep, we read. Thinking back to what happened on Mount Carmel that we mentioned before. Elijah let the prophets of Baal go first. Who's really God? Well, who's, who, who's God? Well, it's the one who sets this sacrifice on fire from heaven. And so Elijah told those prophets of Baal, you go first. I'll let you go first. And if they'd gotten fire from Baal, Elijah would have never gotten a chance. But he let them go first, and, and they do everything they can to summon their God to do something, and nothing happens. And Elijah says several things to taunt them, but one of them that he says is, maybe he's asleep. Maybe your God is asleep. Well, Elijah wasn't the first one that ever said that about a God like Baal. And in fact, people who worship false gods like that said that themselves. There's... In literature, a preserved prayer of a Babylonian where he says, I'm waiting, I'm waiting for my God to wake up. Our God stands out from all of those false ideas of, of what a God is or should be. Our God doesn't sleep. Our God doesn't slumber we might be at an uncertain time in life and we wonder if God notices God never sleeps. God never slumbers. There are people here who, who work really hard. And some of you work shift work and, and sometimes it stretches out to, to 12 hours. And you come home and you sleep about that many because that's all you can do after all of that work. We have a God who's always at work but never needs to rest. He's never caught off guard. He never has to be roused to see what's going on in our lives. I may need a break, but God never does. God made coffee, but he doesn't drink it. So uh, I'm like him. I don't drink it either. But God made it. He doesn't need it. He doesn't need a five-hour energy or a Red Bull. He's always aware. He never slumbers. He never sleeps. I want you to notice something that happens in this psalm from verses 1 and 2 to the rest of it. Where does my help come from? Verse 1. My help comes from the Lord. But then starting in verse 3, He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. And it's like that the rest of the way through. In the first verse or two, you have the psalmist asking the question. Maybe he's asking himself, and he answers himself. He's talking to himself and pumping himself up through the rest of this psalm. Or it could be that he's joined in his song by his fellow travelers, by the people who've, who've got his back. My help comes from the Lord. And, and the people who are with him are saying, it sure does. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. And so it continues. My help comes from the Lord. You need to tell yourself that. I need to tell myself that. And we need to be surrounded by the people who will tell us that, that, that he will not allow your foot to be moved, that he who keeps you will not slumber. You need to trust God 
And then you need to be regularly reaffirmed right here by the people who believe in him and who trust him. Life is uncertain. Keep telling yourself, my help comes from the Lord. Keep spending time with people who will tell you the same thing in the songs like we've sung together this morning. Keep on being where a preacher will tell you there's help from the Lord. Keep on being where your Bible teacher will teach you there's help from the Lord. Keep on being where you'll be with the brothers and sisters, some of whom you've told about what's making life seem so uncertain right now, and let them remind you that your help comes from the Lord. When life is uncertain, the Lord is your keeper, and his people have your back. Besides being our help when life is uncertain, the psalmist wants us to know that He's our helper when the heat is on. Let's read verses 5 and 6. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. Jesus reminded us when he prayed to his Father in John chapter 17, verse 15, that, that we are in the world, but we're not of the world. And the world puts the heat on us. The world puts the heat on our faith, on our morality, on our character. And there's the temptation to become like the world and to be of the world. But the Bible says the Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand, and the sun shall not strike you by day. Sunstroke here is a metaphor for all the dangers of the daytime. The Bible says the Lord is your shade at your right hand. For some reason, the last few weeks, I've noticed how much difference shade and a gentle breeze make while it's hot. When I've been working outside, sitting down, and for a few minutes in the shade, I just feel it more than I used to. Maybe I'm just needing to feel it more than I used to. But here he says, the Lord is at your right hand. He's your shade. I memorized Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7 a long time ago, and it's been so helpful to me. But I want to remember what verse 5 says going along with it. Philippians 4, 5, the Lord is at hand. Now, what's that mean? Now, that could mean he could come at any moment because that's what the New Testament teaches us. But it could also remind us he's always right here. The Lord is at hand. So don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That's Philippians 4, 5 to 7. In Isaiah chapter 57, verse 15, the prophet said, For thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place, and also with him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit, to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. When the heat is on... God is here. He's, he's my keeper. He's the shade at my right hand. My help comes from way above the hills. And when the heat is on, he's at my right hand. Further, the psalmist wants us to know that the Lord is our help in our darkest hours. He said, the sun, verse 6, shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. We speak of sunstroke or heat stroke more often, but there's also that word moonstroke, moonstruck. You ever thought about whence that word came? Well, think about it. The word lunacy, the word lunatic. Are there other words in that family there? What about lunar? 
Remember the lunar landing. Remember the lunar cycle. All, all of that is talking about the moon. And so this word would be especially about being out of our minds. When I'm not thinking right, when I don't know what to think, God's still there. Here's a passage that's encouraging us to trust the Lord deeply, whatever is happening, when life is uncertain, when the heat is on, in, in my darkest hour. It's not promising me that I'm never going to see any uncertainty. It's not promising me that the heat will never be on. It's not promising me that I'll, I'll never face a dark hour. But over and over and over as you read this psalm, you find the Lord is my keeper. He who keeps me. He's the keeper. He's the keeper. Again and again it says. I think about a New Testament emphasis of all these same truths in Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 28. We love it, don't we? The Bible says, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. Those who are the called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Verse 31, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died more than that, who was raised, who is to the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger, or sword, as it is written, for your sake, we're being killed all the day long. We're regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. And before I read the rest of it, doesn't verse 36 there, in quoting the Old Testament, acknowledge God's not making a promise that nothing unwelcome will ever enter our lives. Did God ever promise Dale and Mabel, you won't, you won't face the kind of things you're facing right now? Did God ever tell Edith, Tony, and her family, you're not going to encounter things like this. You, you've had enough in your life. The Bible doesn't say that. And people in the Bible felt the way that we felt feel uh, during our uncertain times, when, when the heat is on, during our darkest hours. But Paul, Paul concludes this great thought, no, in all these things, we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. In all these things, we're going through all these things, never mind, we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. In your darkest hour, your help comes from the Lord. Psalm 121 concludes in verses 7 and 8 with this assurance. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He'll keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. What's found in this psalm is assurance for God's people. He's called in, in verse 4, the one who keeps Israel. 
But it's also assurance for God's person. Because verse 3 says, He keeps you. Verse 5, The Lord is your keeper. Psalm 121 is full of assurance for God's people. Galatians chapter 6, verse 16 tells us that the church is God's Israel today. And Galatians 3, verses 26 and 27 says that you're all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Galatians 4, 4 calls that receiving the adoption of sons. There's help from the Lord for his people. There's help from the Lord for you if you are his person. So this thing, whatever I'm going through, whatever is this next mountain to climb, is not going to do me in. I know where to get help. My help comes from the Lord, maker of heaven and earth. He's my keeper, and he thinks I'm a keeper. We haven't read all of Psalm 121 together. I want to do that as our conclusion, and I hope it'll keep rolling through your mind. Make it do that. Read it some more today. Read it some more this week. Make it central to your playlist in your mind this week and throughout life. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He'll keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. Put that in your playlist this week. Make those words a mantra. Meditate on them. Let them fill your heart. Let them roll from your lips. Offer them back up to God in prayer and praise. And let's encourage each other with words like this. Tonight, if you're, or this morning, if you're ready to be one of God's people and know the assurance that His Word gives in a psalm like this, we want to help you with that. We're giving you an opportunity while we come and sing together.